idea that we feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Eylül'dan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers, a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Nailing It Down here on Barmblog. And today I'm going to talk about systemization versus bureaucratization. But we're going to have to take many detours to understand this. We're going to have to talk about uh, the socialist turned fascist sociologist, Robert Michels. We're going to have to talk about Stafford Beer and cybernetics theory. We're going to have to talk about John Hattie and um, meta studies on um, effective education and Stafford Beer and how corporate uses of cybernetics actually led to some interesting results. But first, before I go into that, I'm going to explain a little about who I am and how I began to think this way. This is classically an educational pattern. Now, I'm going to model this for you so that you know what I'm doing. Right? I'm going to actually teach this instead of like I do a podcast, like I teach a mini lecture for a class. I'm going to model how you get to certain kinds of results. Because it's actually directly relevant to what I'm talking about. See, modeling is a part of systemization. Not just modeling as in drawing out the systems so you can conceptually map them and see them, but also modeling as in doing things which others can mimic and instigating social and parasocial uh, relationships that trigger certain responses to learning in the brain. I always bring up Hattie's Effect, uh, effect size ratios, which are these metacognitive studies where we look at the effect of an intervention that can be controlled by a school or a teacher on a student. Now, what you'll be surprised to know is uh, the most important factors that can change a student's education are actually in the student themselves. And they are informed by the student's social context. All right. So like with you, I can't make any student learn. I can't make you learn. If you come here, you want to be here, you want to listen. So I invite you to stay. And I'm going to try to make it interesting so you know what I'm going to be telling you. Now, the left in general, but in specifically more than other forms of philosophy, likes bureaucratization. Uh, bureaucracies are systems of rules. They have formal functions, and they're designed to make things impartial. They seem, in many ways, inherently democratic, as they are non-arbitrary. You have many checks and many points of the bureaucracy to go against arbitrary accumulation of power, but they do not check against arbitrary accumulation of skills and knowledge. Bureaucratization is generally an attempt at a kind of system decision. One, that government's light because it buys a lot of people into the system because it provides work. Work which can be used to generate incomes based off of a larger social system. Bureaucracies have to subsist on a pretty steady base. All right? Now, I got interested in this space for reasons that had nothing to do with the left or education or any of that. Actually, it had everything to do with education, but nothing to do with educating people for left-wing causes. I, I just wanted to teach people English better in foreign language contexts with a highly variable amount of teachers who would come in and out. So teaching, and particularly as I, I've talked about before, is a field where 
accumulated knowledge and accumulated skills are often not even in, in whack in the same person. And if you lose a teacher, you can lose either a tons of accumulated knowledge because they've done separate study or tons of accumulating skills that they picked up by interactions with children in the context in which they teach. Now, most teaching environments are unfortunately authoritarian. They're authoritarian for a couple of systemic reasons. A lot of teachers become control freaks, right? There's studies on this, actually. They do. It's not because they're inherently already cops. It's not why they're attracted to it. That's actually an interesting distinction. No, what normally happens is they have to control and standardize a classroom experience for a variety of kids who are compelled to be in the situation. Better teachers... Um, their primary job in a lot of ways is to educate, but to get good educational results, they have to build a good relationship with the student and then it's hard in an institutional capacity. Furthermore, um, if you have a highly variable staff in almost all educational in institutions in the United States now do, except for the very elite schools, um, for reasons that are beyond the scope that I can do in a 20 minute video, but also, when I taught at very elite schools in other countries where the staff had to move from country to country often um, for a variety of reasons, political instability, uh, alienation from their home country, uh, they earned enough money while they were there to move on to a place that they found easier to live, any number of these reasons, we started becoming interested in systematizing what is normally bureaucratized. Because in bureaucracies, yes, you have a bunch of rules, but the social accumulation falls away. Now, bureaucratization, uh, bureaucratization is something conservatives like to rail about, but they're not totally wrong here. Bureaucracies create incentives for knowledge capture, where you want to keep the knowledge within the person, thus the expert, you know, the, the, the expertise, and hoard it and also hoard it to the access of rules. So I give you access to this thing and I give you access to this knowledge because I know the rules. I know who you need to speak to. If I make that transparent, I actually lose my note and power and become dispensable. A lot of schools realized that this led to a big problem once schools became more unstable. You had huge losses of knowledge and skills. Now, I'm interested in systems, I'm interested in education, and I started looking at the educational research, and I also started looking at management theory. And a lot of management theory was based on Taylorism and GE stuff in the in the mid-50s, uh, systemically, you know, uh, you know, weakening uh, the, the weak links of the chain, et cetera, and so forth. Um, but what we what you learn from actually looking at this, uh and you look at it like fidelity and practices, it was better to systematize, create checklists, ensure training, and actually it was cheaper even for the businesses to invest in the people um, and make sure that those skills were democratized within a division. Now, businesses don't want things too democratized because there's a breakdown of their business hierarchy, which is a different video and a different thing to talk about. But schools have kind of a very simple hierarchy. There are students, there are stakeholders and there's administration, and then there are teachers as an intermediary between all three. Who has the power in the situation? Well, the administration is administering the will of the state, so in theory, they have the most power. But in any given exchange where these different factors meet, the power relationship can actually change. So... In a school, you have a relatively flat hierarchy most of the time, even within departments, et cetera, and so forth. Like most teachers, yes, there's a senior teacher. Yes, you'll have a mentor-mentee relationship. Yes, a teacher may make more than another teacher based on seniority or merit pay or whatever. Um, but there are very few incent incentives if you're looking at the best results for the student for teachers to hoard information. If you assess teachers however, on like individual test scores or um, this, that, and the other, there have become all kinds of incentives for them to actually hoard information at the, the degeneracy of the educational possibilities for the students. The tendency to bureaucratize has been a main big problem in education because whenever there's a problem, you would create a, a corresponding function. So if, and with state funds, even when they're not spending a lot per student, 
um, and they often aren't, they have a they have an economy of scale. So they can hire someone who specializes in this, that, or the other thing to go and train whatever uh, better teaching practices. But they have a tendency to hoard that information and hoard their access to other people in that bureaucratic system. This actually fits what Robert Michel, the student of Max Weber and uh, Werner Sombart, um, who became a fascist, and I'm going to talk about why in a minute. Uh, picked up in the 19 teens. Um, Robert Michel uh, was part of the, the the Social Democratic Party of Germany, actually. Um, and when he moved to Italy, he became a part of the Italian Socialist Party. And he was even aligned with the left of the Italian Socialist Party, the uh, the Revolutionary Syndicalist Wing, which while it also had a, a, a whole sliver of it, the Nationalist Syndicalist Wing that became a, a heresy of fascism, he saw the problem of the bureaucratization that he saw in the SP day as huge. So what he saw in the SP day was, was a relatively democratic organization, which would find problems, place people to, to, to fix those problems that be paid for by the organization. They would start skills hoarding and they would become an oligarchy within the organization. In fact, this led him to the iron law of oligarchy. And this led him to actually support fascism, which he saw as in its in its uh, combination of left and right, less given towards bureaucratization because it would invest a lot in a single uh, democratically elected, in, in theory anyway, uh, figure that had less oligarchical impetus to fight the oligarchy and that this tension um, would mitigate but not get rid of the iron law oligarchy and he would go on so much to say that all democratic forms would form an elite it was just he thought the fascists were more honest about it and thus it was more democratic now what does this have to do with what i was talking about with bureaucratization education well bureaucratization was something that he saw as the foundation of oligarchical tendencies in democracy. And in 1911, he wrote a book before he'd even become aligned with the fascists called Political Parties, a Sociological Study of Oligarchical Tendencies in Modern Democracy. At least that's what's called in English. Now, I talked about his political past because the idea of a very active elite was something he saw to go against the bureaucratic knowledge capture and tendency to form new classes that he saw emerging as a social dynamic within relatively democratic and socialist parties in Europe. There's been a tendency of Marxists to just deny this, just deny that what Robert Michel was talking about is real. Um, our Robert Michel. Uh, I've never known how to pronounce it. I don't know if, if, if it was born in Germany and pronounced it the French way or not, but that's not a human there. Um, what I started learning, though, is actually looking into Stafford Beer and Norbert Wiener. I started actually studying why the John Dewey educational reforms had not really worked. Like, I'd I watched, for example, the so uh, the I'd studied actually even um, the democratization of rural schooling in the Mexican Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, uh, particularly during Great Leap Forward, and even more so during the Cultural Revolution. Right, it's one of those things where whatever you can say about the Great Leap Forward, are which in many ways was disastrous because of this very bureaucratic impulse. Well, Mao's answer to the bureaucratic impulse is largely similar to Robert Michel's, which is to take a highly popular central authority to crush um, bureaucratic, bureaucratic drift, um, you know, capitalist rotors in the intermediary peers, even though they were democratically elected. But we're beginning to hoard knowledge and also hoard and control access to quotas, uh, extend quotas, this, that, and the other. 
Um, and I say all this because this is a combination of many things that you're going to hear coming up in the show that don't seem related um, that it actually are. All right. When we talk about education, there are three levels of understanding, basically. And you can break them down in the Bloom's taxonomy. You can look at them over and over again. But there is surface level understanding where you understand the concepts. You have clear definitions. You know the facts about something. There's deep understandings where you start understanding the ambiguities, the possible problems, but only in context to itself. Like you can start seeing the ambiguities and Irrational numbers and math. Uh, most people have issues getting to this deep level of conversation. And then we want to do this third thing. And this is where real innovation and in systems building can happen. And that is transfer. Where you start seeing the ambiguities so well that you can see their relationship to things that do not seem immediately obvious. And so what I'm doing with you here is showing how I come to some of these conclusions. A lot of times you guys are asking me to give you one book that I can tell you to just find a source. You can click and you can read it. And you can understand. That is not how learning works. That is a very scholastic model of learning that is based on this idea that you can just read about something and it's going to give you a clear picture. You need to read about something. You need to go deep with it and you go deep with it by applying it to other things and by practice. So let's talk about the systems building thing in bureaucratization here. What I was seeing as happening in the schools was the bureaucratization was emerging to handle a knowledge loss problem, but it itself was leading to a knowledge loss problem. And this was also something the administration was seeing. All right. So in the, in particularly in international schools, because they were private, but also even in public schools, you start seeing this idea of designing and building systems checklist things you can do now there's problems with this too you can make them too rigid which is it becomes its own form of bureaucratization because people just start viewing this as a checklist in which some bureaucrat can come and check 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 and adjudicate if you're doing your job well enough no systems however are based on the idea and i'm going to give it you a good quote from stanford beer here so you to really understand what i'm talking about that um, uh, modeling is modeling different parts of a system and that you want people to be able to step into a part of that, get the information that they need and be able to function at a high level without personal expertise. This is not saying you're gonna make everyone who steps into that role equal. There will be people who are better temperamentally, academically, uh, physically at things um, than other people. And systematizing it will never bring people up to the, to the level of mastery and transfer in true excellence, but it will bring people up to proficiency or better. So what general systems theory seems to do is actually based off work. And I think it's interesting because if you take what Beer wrote in Designing Freedom, which can read like management speak and replace and take the word business out of it, you'll see what I mean. General systems theory, as originally intended by Von uh, Bertalanathne, is an ideal framework for modeling business enterprise. Work in its most civilized form should enrich, empower, and emancipate. Sounds a lot like Marx. That's just me adding there. Um, this continues to find ways to support work as a humanistic, not mechanistic endeavors. We endeavor to seek out new models of business to support and enhance the individual as well as the collective whole. And given all this new technology, we need institutions for handling it. So cybernetic theory is based on the idea that these mechanical gadgets that we give that take so much from our lives in the capitalist world actually give us instant feedback. You see this in design of something I do in my daily job, which is online education, right? Um, most online education is shit. It's designed to be shit. What it's actually trying to do is to increase the amount of students an individual teacher can, can give information to in this banking concept, leave them totally on their own to practice it with very little zones of proximal development activated because they're not in a social context. They're not learning from their peers who are the primary people who they're going to learn from anyway. 
Um, and thus it ruins a lot of good education, but there's no reason why it has to. Similarly, most things that you do on social media for organizing or politics is maladaptive. It captures you to a certain political party, actually makes you irrelevant, unable to be a bargaining chapter, locks you into certain positions, creates more and more bureaucracy around that, confuses eyes or attention with actual engagement, uh, confuses engagement with practice and understanding, and, and we never even get to a proper organization except for the creation of more bureaucracies. So to get back to my original point, we see this tendency of bureaucracies to create skills capture points. We see this systemization. Bureaucracy is a kind of systemization, right? It's using a person to do that, to fix that problem, to spread it out amongst other people, but usually it actually creates a new skills capture point or a new point of power that someone in the nexus can abuse and formalize. Well, cybernetic theory is actually made to disperse that out and what you see that on not cybernetic principles but on systems principles we also see that in schools how do you systematize knowledge and social gains in a way that an individual person can get it and you do it by collectivities of peers in fact the more diverse these peers are in their perspective you really are stronger because different ways different natural inclinations skill shot uh, are done in practice kind of in an action research way. You can take that in, systematize it, see if it works in different contexts with different people, see if it's person specific or technique specific and incorporate it into your plethora of information and skills that you can use. And unfortunately, the bureaucratization of most schools, particularly most public schools, unfortunately, because they're massive in their scope, discourages is except in the departmental level. So you actually see a lot of this within a department, but you need to see a lot more of it all the way across the school. Good smart uh, good smart schools designers, good smart union designers even. Uh, when people talk about social unionizing, this is one of the things they're doing in the union is socializing the effects and making sure that union organizers, uh, whether they be paid or elected, do not hoard all this information because you become more useful to your community if you can spread this information out. You want to systematize, create checklists, uh, create, uh, collect information from multiple imports and multiple people, share that information so different people can try it out, create systems for implementing that information, send it out in checklist, send it out in quick ways, use quick feedback loops to get advice, um, I like the word advice and not feedback because feedback is something you do as a critic. Advice is something you do collaboratively, but either way, it'll work. And you start creating systems on a gnarly ribosomic level. All right. So this is not highly centralized. It's not, it's not necessarily always the most efficient way, but it is robust. All right. So a robust set of feedbacks and systems get multiple people to do things that work and figure out things that work for them. And it creates a function in which multiple people can step into as opposed to a role like a bureaucrat. The more people who can do that function, the more less likely there is to be skills hoarding and oligarchy developing out of it. This is something that we that I use in designing departments and education, working with people, working with teacher teams, um, teaching educators, et cetera. This is a system that I use. Now, I don't use it for business. And in fact, Stanford Beer, the guy I'm quoting you from the management theory, is also didn't always use it for business. After all, he was the, one of the consultants who worked with the trailing government to invent Cybersyn, and it led him to believe that even maybe money are even labor tokens and epistemic feedbacks as knowledge mechanisms weren't necessary with very simple computing. We're not talking about mega computers that do all you thinking for you. That's, that's science fiction. It's not, I don't know that it's impossible, but I find it highly unlikely. No, what you're doing is creating feedback loops so people can make those decisions, but they can do it in a role and it will democratize those skills. Will everybody be equally good at them? No. 
Every cook can govern does not mean every cook can govern well. And we live in a highly complex society in which this is a problem. But if we don't democratize these skills, if we continue to bureaucratize them, we will make our educational models, as well as our entire society, over complex. And the efficiency that we may have gained from centralization will be lost. No, we need systemization, not bureaucratization. This is how you synthesize knowledge. You can go for breadth or depth. Our education system right now goes for depth. It goes for hyper knowledge about smaller and smaller chunks and discourages innovation by transfer. But it means that even, um, remember the three stages of education that I'm talking about, it means that a lot of even the smartest people are only in the center stage, and that's where they're staying because that's where they're incentivized to stay. Because if they don't do that, the democratic, they're democratizing their knowledge base, and democratizing their knowledge base endangers them. Now, there's problems in this. There's the problem of noise and the problem of giving people access to information before you give them the skills to understand it, which is a huge problem. If you ever talk about fake news or people believing BS, it's not because people are stupid. It's because they're usually their immediate incentives are not aligned with what you want them to be and their incentives to believe BS, whether it be psychological, social, which it normally is, are both um, are enhanced and we've given them infinite information and no ability to judge it. The ability, however, is not to just rely on experts because the experts also lie. The distrust that people have in experts is actually rational because people know about skills hoarding. People know about people using this to get social advantage. People know about this innately. Robert Michel's discovered something that people have been talking about since Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle used the words oppositely, oligarchy meaning ruled by the many, turning into democracy, which ruled by the mob. Um, but our, you know, oligarchy isn't ruled by specific groups, smaller groups, ruled by group, right? Well, Aristotle uses those terms are different than ours. But my point is that that tendency of movement has been observed since people were writing down complex social systems. We need to think about how our current technology allows us to do things differently. by systematizing. We need to not always think about how prior forms existed. We don't even exist in a world on the scale of people even a hundred years ago. The numbers of people that you're dealing with have to feed and deal with logistically is almost exponentially larger than even a hundred years ago. When I'm always dropping real numbers when I'm talking about historical comparisons between this or that socialist party, uh, and now I'm also having to, to tell people and also adjust for the population of the country in the world, which was way different. So you don't understand the scale. But these kinds of systems are ribosomic. They can spread out. They can be they can be replicated in pods, and they can remove that need for oligarchy that develops when you have to develop a person to do what a system can do. You over-rely on people you incentivize in the skill share in ways that even doesn't always help them. People who work in departments where knowledge is shared and when people in the department have relatively equal access and share skills and perspectives, even if it's sometimes most comfortable, are usually happier than people who work in the departments who don't. Now, I know that from my job, but I'd also imagine that's true in organizations, political movements, etc. And that's something you really need to think about in designing your political movements. And in the discussions I hear about this or that thing on Marxism or this or that thing about the working class, people are not thinking about these basic differences. They're just throwing around words. 
that have long lost their communicative meaning, meaning that we're not even dealing with the deep level of knowledge there. We're dealing with the surface level and a surface level where the definitions are unclear. So this is why my interest inform what I do with you now. I am interested in poetry because I care about language. I am interested in international affairs because I've, because I've been exposed to people all over the world. I am interested in systems because I want things to work. What we learned with Dewey, to go back to how Deweyism failed, Deweyism developed concurrently to many of the, to Vygotsky and Russia and to the reforms of the people's schools in rural China. Um, what we have learned is that people do tend to build systems that are good for them immediately. You know, most parents want a decent education for their children. They want it, though, tied into a life that they are actually likely to live. And progressive education seems to do that. But progressive education was still built into this model that was preparing people for work and solely for work. And thus progressive education became another way for educational bureaucrats to lock the education system into the current class modalities in which, in which we see. It's a way to make a worker, not or a citizen or whatever, but it's not a way to someone to synthesize it into a whole, not because the kind of practical reforms that Dewey was advocating for were bad, but because he advocated for them in the context that create all kinds of points of capture for what those practical democratizing skills were going to be used for. Building systems. If you create a system where people get to hoard skills and hide those skills from people who might be apt to do them, but aren't allowed to or are shut out because of knowledge capture, or because of opportunity capture, you are creating a system that will eventually become fragile because the person hoarding all the knowledge is not just because it's unequal, although that's its own problem. It is also hyper fragile because if the person hoarding all the knowledge doesn't share it before it's over, what happens to your system? It falls apart. And this is constantly a problem with the complication of bureaucracies. This is what Joseph Tainer was talking about with overcomplicated civilizations. You can see it in bureaucratization. And this is what you should be thinking about whenever you design any political system. Bureaucratization is not systematization. It is a form of systematization with particular downsides. And we often do not talk about that when we address conservatives who use bureaucratic drift, knowledge capture, and opportunity capture to come after all of our principles. We don't need to do that anymore. We need to be much smarter. Model it. Think about it. Start linking these things together. I know the discursive way that I talk and think can lose people. It can seem like a bunch of tangents that aren't related. And it is hard people to always model what I see. And some of them are tangents, frankly. But these links are how you start building more robust change and you do it from watching things in your daily life. What do you do in your daily life that works and what doesn't? Well, when I started trying to apply these systems that I have been trying to build in a school uh, for a highly unstable staff to a political organization that was obsessed with um, constitutions from the 19th and early 20th century and realized that we weren't, we might have been democratizing votes, but we weren't democratizing leadership skills or power. And that created a hyper fragile system where one or two leaders leaving could break the entire organization. I realized that I needed to transfer my skills from one thing to another. And that is what I'm trying to do right now. And with that, I hope you keep on nailing it with a hammer. Like and subscribe if you're interested for more of these kinds of discussions, because I don't really care how broadly viral these kind of videos go. If you come here and you find me, you learn something, you do for it, you, you do something with it, that's the important thing. Start thinking about how to build systems that incorporate more people and relatively equal power nodes so that there aren't a lot of fragile nodes in your chain where someone can hoard power 
are someone who isn't isn't even hoarding power. It's just you have this super good person who does this really well, and you become hyper dependent on them. If they leave, your system breaks. You don't want that. You do not want that. Think about it. Some things the business world does, they do it because it works. And with that, good night.